those people who you know are aware of art in the country at the moment you know really would have not much doubt in saying that Jonathan Miles Lee is up there as one of the best artists in the UK today so he's one of the top handful of artists that are producing truly exceptional work so from a purely artistic perspective incredible you know incredible artist really clients are in royalty and famous they speak for themselves in terms of the kind of people who look for his art buy his pictures so to a certain extent that that speaks for himself he's also been a guest at harvard university and lectured at harvard he lives in beautiful sunny bath which looks very sunny and pleasant this evening in royal crescent um and generally he's an all-round good egg um good <laughs> so the, the question here is what is the future of british art and culture and are we destroying it so we no more further ado i'll hand over to jonathan miles lee thank you for coming along jonathan and i'll uh, i'll just hand over to you to, to address the question at the moment well thanks very much lance that was a very nice introduction it's uh, it's lovely to see you all here i can see you all on the screen um uh, it's, a, it's a big subject, isn't it? Uh, and not very long to discuss it. So I'm going to use, like an artist would do, a really big brush, big broad strokes to sort of flesh out what, what we're talking about here. We're talking about culture. And I think we are in a position of peril, aren't we? We have to admit that. It's a bit of a scary time for us. It's almost as scary as uh, Russia 1914, I feel, sometimes. You know, it's almost pre-revolutionary period. Um, you know, and um, I think the reason for that is that there are three worldviews trying to control us at the moment, uh, three very strong forces, and I'm going to explain what those are and why we're feeling a bit uncomfortable. Um, so on the, on, the, on the right we have, uh, we have to admit, Islam, which is, um, as we can see from the last few days, um, not particularly interested in freedom of speech. So the problems with this, the, the, the teacher in Batley should indicate to us that we need to be a little bit more literate in our understanding of what Islam is and we also need to understand a little bit about the demographic changes in the country so in about 30 years time 35 years time Islam will be perhaps 50 percent of the country so it's just something we need to look ahead towards and decide whether Sharia law is something that we we want to incorporate into British culture and then on the other side we have the left the woke culture which is also not interested in freedom of speech at all <laughs> um, also treats everybody as a sort of conglomerate you're either you know you're part of you're white or you're male you know you're not really respected as an individual you're being treated as a group which is obviously unfair that's frightening because we can see what where this comes from it's sort of a neo-marxist inspi inspiration and we only need to look at russia and china to see what it leads to it's very scary so i was thinking about this over the last few days normally when you're being strangled to death there are only two hands around your throat, aren't there? <laughs> we've got three. <laughs> we've got something else. We've got this technocracy. We've got uh, big tech, which surprisingly is also not interested in freedom of speech. So uh, people are being cancelled, deplatformed. Um, and really, you could argue that that's, that's our public space, especially during lockdown. We're not being able to meet people socially as easily or at all. So our public square is being controlled by this force, this worldview. So we've got these three very strong forces oppressing us. I must just say, the, this idea, which I think is a really good way of looking at it, comes from some conversations I've been having in the last few days with a man called Gavin Ashenden, who is um, a chaplain to the Queen for, for about 10 years. An incredible man. You can look at his web, website, ashenden.org. And I've been having a chat to him about this, and it really helped me to sort of um, clarify what it is we're talking about. So we've got left, right, and then this technocratic uh, element as well, and with the hovering sort of spectre of uh, the World Economic Forum as well, pressing upon us in a different direction, you know, with uh, digital control and, and um, you know, spy technology, essentially. So um, I think that we need to think about what is the antidote to this. And over the last few weeks, as I've been talking to people who've been, you know, in restricted positions in lockdown, they have actually started talking about, to me about more spiritual subjects because we do feel a bit cornered, don't we? Um, and I've been surprised that people who wouldn't have perhaps really started thinking about, um, you know, the church. You know, the church is not really helping us throughout this, the Anglican church or whatever. Then the church has not really been there for us. But people have definitely been leaning more towards a spiritual angle and thinking, 
Well, on a physical level, things are feeling very uncomfortable, but maybe it's not just a culture war on a temporal level. Maybe, maybe it's sort of a spiritual battle as well that's taking place. Um, you know, people are at different, different stages in this, in this realization, I think. But, you know, I think it's possible to think of the Judeo-Christian -Christ heritage that we have as an, a rather extraordinary manifestation. That, that's been around what, over a thousand, a thousand years for us. And every structure really in British culture somehow relates to that. And I think you can see that in Tom Holland's book, um, is it Dynasty? Uh, um, you know, he explained that even if you're not a Christian, if you've never had you know, a lineage of Christianity, the culture that we're living in was formed by Christianity. You know, we're surrounded by manifestations of it, aren't we? Our churches, our guilds, which have passed away really, but the way that we interact, even the way that the law is, is the common law is put together. This is something you can read about in a book by Roger Scruton, which I'm always mentioning. It's called England and Elegy, um, and it's, it looks like this. Um, that's the one you can get from uh, Amazon, and it's, a, it's an amazing, in, in, it makes you fall in love with Britain again, really, because it, it, it reminds you of all those wonderful manifestations which were very British, uh, which we're in the process of losing. M many of these things we have lost, actually. So, um, so that, that, was, that was something I was going to talk about. And then the next thing was, I was trying to work out really what British culture was. It's very difficult to define, isn't it? And I was also wondering why I feel a little bit distanced from it, when, uh, certainly distanced from contemporary British culture, because I don't really interact with it that much anymore. I used to think if the National Trust and the BBC, if something happened to them, oh, I wouldn't want to be in Britain anymore. You know, there were things that really um, I've held in very high regard. But over the last, what, 10, 15 years, um, we all know what's been happening to the National Trust. We, you know, I've, I felt really disaffected going to see these, you know, what I hoped to see a lovely uh, country house or garden, which has then been, I don't want to say desecrated, but sort of overlaid with these political messages of feminism. And, you know, the politics got, really got in the way and it, it made me want to visit them less. And also the same with the BBC TV and even radio. I listen to more radio than television because I'm painting all the time. And I found I was just switching it off all the time. I don't want to be beaten over the head uh, with militant feminism and all the other things, you know, the, the transgender sort of meme that's been going on for the last two or three years. So what's happened is this process of me retreating, really, from British contemporary culture. And I suddenly thought, well, if, if I feel like that, maybe a lot of people, a lot of other people feel like that. They don't want this culture of repudiation and negativity and always picking on the negative aspects of British history, picking it apart in this very postmodern way. Um, and I think that what we need to do is start doing something a bit radical. My, my idea was, if we're thinking about sort of policies, is to ex exchange all of those, uh, those courses that you, you're forced to participate in at work, sort of um, bias, you know, teaching you not to be biased and um, what do they call them? gender bias sort of uh, courses, kind of scrap them because they, I think it's been proved that they're counterproductive. And if you've got time and the money to run those sorts of little courses at work and in institutions, maybe exchange them for um, a little bit of extra education, a little injection of positivity about British culture. We could, we could have, um, you know, w what we need to do is, is rebuild our sense of confidence in ourselves because we've been psychically attacked basically by this neo-Marxist postmodernist, um, you know, wokeism. It's gone, I think, as far as it can do. We've reached a bit of a tipping point because everybody's talking about it. Everybody's irritated by it, even when, even if they sort of buy along, go along with it publicly. I think, yeah, we've reached a tipping point. So um, I think if we could put some policies in, in place which were really promoting diversity, true diversity, political diversity, rather than having shortlists which it's all based on race and sex you know um, and and also the the equalities act i think my idea would be to cancel the equalities act because that's the mechanism which allows all of this um, equality of outcome that uh, which is the which is a real problem which we've got we've got that happening in universities bbc even uh, gchq um, I'm trying to cover a lot of ground in a short time so we can get on to the questions. Uh, going on, we're talking about arts and culture, going on to arts, um, the Brit art movement, which I always, I always like to mention it starting when Blair, Blair came into power in 1997 with that whole uh, Cool Britannia. 
the manifestation of it, you could say it started early with the Saatchis, but it was very cynical, wasn't it? The art that's produced is very uh, disturbing on the whole. You look at the, the work of the Chapman brothers uh, and Gilbert and George, um, the, the imagery that they use is so, I think, sort of so depressing and so um, degenerate, really. And it just seems to get worse every year. The, the, the things that were produced by the Turner Prize were never really uplifting. And as an artist that's focused on beauty, um, I, I found that what, what I was missing was this magical element, something that transported you and took, took you into another transcendental realm, which is what Art of the Past always has done for me. When I, I can look at a, um, an old master drawing and I can just drift into a sort of a, you know, an altered state almost. It has, a, has an extraordinary visceral effect upon me. And, and the reason I think things are changing is because something happened in a lecture that P Jordan Peterson gave recently. I think everybody knows who he is now and the problems that he's been through. But um, he started moving in more of a spiritual direction as well. He's been giving some lectures on the books of the Bible. And I was watching something the other day that he did on Genesis. I was, it, but some, something happened in the middle of this lecture that I saw on YouTube. He was trying to explain what the role of artists was and the role of art. And he was really struggling for the words. He didn't know really what to say. But in the, in the movement from the front of the stage, carrying a glass over to a bottle of water on the, on, the, on the lectern, he said, art is, I can't do his voice, a bit like Kermit, art is, you know, um, an artist's, well, they are, and there was a pause. He said, well, they're like a portal to the divine, aren't they? And there was a silence in the audience. And then a, a little some murmuring of applause, which grew and grew and grew. And it was a really special moment because it, it meant that people had suddenly connected with what art was there for originally. Art came out of this experience of, um, you know, you're trying to express something about another world, something higher, something more ideal, um, something that lifted the spirit and trans transformed you in some way, rather than being an object to sell or to shock. There was an exhibition, I think it must have been 20, 25 years ago, Sensation, Sensations at RA, the RA, Royal Academy in London. And it, it made you feel a bit ill. It was the one that had the, <laughs> the sharks in formaldehyde. I remember there was a calf's head and you could hear the buzzing before you got near the, the calf's head because there were flies inside this sort of vitrine. It was so awful. But lots of the young artists that have been going through the art schools in the last 20 years have been told by their art teachers to make uh, you know, something gimmicky that will make a splash, that will get them into uh, the Metro newspaper or the Evening Standard. So they're all scrabbling around to, trying to do something really shocking and, and trying to be really shocking as people as well. Whereas um, I think, again, we've gone as far as we can with that. And I think this period of lockdown has been a period of uh, sort of contemplation, sort of a, it, a lot, we've been restricted in what we can do. So we've really started looking at our essential values. And our essential values, that in all of us, there is, there is a desire for some sort of spiritual development. After we've developed intellectually, we, we want to develop on a spiritual level. And I think that's, that's something that's breaking through. That's one of, the, one of the positive things that's come out of this national tragedy. And also being, everyone being a little bit poorer, you know, it perhaps does make you work on a slightly different level. It makes you turn inner more. I thought you might like to discuss some of the subjects, bring some things up. Ian, we're talking about British culture and British art here. How European is British culture anyway? Are we really actually talking about European culture, yeah. not, not British? Yeah, of course. And do you think there is any kind of culture that is uniquely British, that is distinctly British, or, or, or is it actually really Greek and Roman? Well, I mean, we're embedded in Western civilization, aren't we? So we're part of a great swathe of time which postmodernists would say, oh, it's all cultural appropriation. But it's very natural. You look at, you can see that in paintings. Paintings have incorporated aspects of all parts of the globe. You say, yes, so you can. I was in Bath, in Bath Abbey today. I was the only visitor. Uh, very few people knew it was open. And I was looking at the angels and the way that the, they were depicted. And they look very much like uh, the, the, the figures, the female figures, are the caryatids that were on the Erechtheion in Athens. So we've inherited these, that's the, the wonderful thing, we've inherited all these amazing forms from the deep, distant past. Um, and, we, and all of these things are fed into our culture all over Europe. And I was just saying to you earlier, privately, in the Renaissance period in Italy and in France and in Britain, all the courts of those countries were 
were copying each other in the way that they dressed and the way that they uh, they moved and the art they collected so we we're part of this very very rich european culture um but we're sort of losing that we're becoming more globalist um and unfortunately digital technology is erasing it's we're becoming a bit more homogenized aren't we so i think this idea of educating ourselves again looking back so i've, I've got a few books actually we used to, we all used to read cicero um what's this uh, i think everybody should read should see uh, kenneth clark's civilization series i was very lucky i was shown that uh, i think there's a 12 program made in 1969 it should be dated but it's not it's really worth seeing seeing still seeing and i think if you show uh, young people that you're pointing at things that they would never perhaps see and you're you're actually taking them on a, a tour of the whole of europe it's like a little mini grand tour that series kenneth clark 1969 and i don't think it's ever been bet bettered um i think um everybody should have a, a little book of english architecture because i, I was lucky i did english i did history of art and architecture when i was doing my A-levels, they still offer it. I don't know whether you can still do that A-level, but it means that wherever I go, not just in England, I can look above the shops and I can interpret, I can really appreciate and fall in love with the built environment and I can, I can make judgments. We're allowed to make judgments. We're allowed to say that brutalist building is a monstrous carbuncle. It's the Prince of Wales' word, isn't it? And this one is wonderful. You, you, you're able to interpret and appreciate more, more breadth of, of your surroundings. It's why I moved to Bath. It's a UNESCO site. I mean, I'm surrounded by, by such, such beauty here. And as I, as I said uh, in one of my other videos, even when it's locked down, there's nobody on the streets. The, the, the buildings themselves feel like you're, they're your friends because they have familiar proportions. Um, uh, they resonate with you. The columns take you back to the 18th century. They take you back to the Roman period, to the Greek period. And I think it's a shame not to have all that, that frame of reference in your, in your mind. It might seem very reactionary, but this was an important point I thought this morning. It's not necessarily backward looking to pick up the tools that we've thrown on the ground in, over the last century, really in the last 50 or 60 years, since the 60s, I think it's been particularly. So we've thrown down the tools which help us to produce beautiful art. We're in the process of throwing down vocabulary, picking it apart. Um, and even sheet music. I think there was an article in today's Telegraph or yesterday's Telegraph about you know abandoning teaching um, sheet music for music. So w these are tools which we have dis we've, we've we've dispensed with. We need to pick them back up and start using them again because they're essential. They're not just things from the past. We need those tools. We need a good vocabulary. We need education that in it maybe even incorporates rhetoric. And um, I've got a book on uh, you know, classical edu edu education here. There's a lot of liberal arts colleges that are starting to reteach that in America. Um, there may be some in England I don't know anything about. Anyway, so th those are a few more ideas. But isn't it, isn't, it, isn't it just about putting money into the arts, though, Jonathan? Isn't it really, when it comes down to it, what can we do for the arts? What can we do for British culture? I know, plough the money in. Because that seems to be what they ask all the time, isn't it? Why don't we just create money and give it to artists? No, it doesn't work. Because <laughs> I've, I've got this book here, it's, it's from the Amsterdam University Press, Why Are Artists Poor? So I, I, mean, I, when I lived in London, I knew a lot, a lot of uh, uh, artists and actors, and their main conversation would be, I'm sorry, friends, um, oh, why not getting enough money from the government funding or whatever? You could argue that there's a lot of art that uh, wouldn't be made without that money and perhaps shouldn't be made. There's a, there's a lot of bad art that's publicly funded, I'm afraid. But I do think that um, you need to maintain and especially boost the funding to orchestras at the moment, national orchestras, um, the theatre, ballet, and um, obviously the theatres need a boost. So I think those, those big expensive productions, but so far as giving money to individual artists, I think it's like, um, it's like uh, giving money. It doesn't help them. And it does, a lot of those people, you could say, well, they needed to develop another, uh, another form of work. I've been very lucky. I've never worked through a gallery or had an agent because the work I've produced is, is, is not about me. It's not about oh, witnessing my pain. You know, it's not the uh, sort of Tracy Emin type of thing, uh, self-referential. -refer it's a service. And art, I, I've always thought, because I'm a real traditionalist, art is about love. It's like producing something that somebody's going to treasure not just now, but for many generations. So I take myself out of the equation altogether. I'm a craftsman, but I produce work which is unique and tailored for every client. And people will always buy that. If you produce something which is really unique um, and, and good quality and lasting, it will sell. It will always find buyers. It will always find funding. But if you are the sort of artist 
who uh, you know is constantly drumming, um, saying, you know, I, I deserve a living. I deserve a living. It's the wrong approach, I'm afraid. Um, next question. <laughs> Okay, well, thanks very much for that, Okay. Uh, John, Jonathan. So, Jonathan, um, following the pandemic, many people may feel that they want to sort of reset their priorities in their lives and, as you said, sort of be more spiritual and even maybe focus more on the arts. So I was wondering what is the single thing that you think the government could do right now to boost British culture? What could it do to boost British culture? I think um, there are lots of things that you can do without spending money, actually. It's about refocusing, isn't it? So, and it's about the story we tell about ourselves. So I would certainly try to, I, I mean, I really love what Lawrence Fox is saying, actually, in his, his, his campaign to become London mayor. Um, he talks about this culture of repudiation, which is something that Roger Struton talked about. We've got to stop talking about ourselves in negative terms. We don't have anything to be embarrassed about. Even slavery, I think our history, our Britain's history with, in relationship with slavery is actually pretty amazing. The more, we, the more that the information comes out, I've been reading a couple of great big books on slavery. You know, we didn't just end slavery, which has been in every civilization going back for thousands of years. We, we lost lots of ships in the British Navy through the West Africa squadron. And we, we paid off uh, owners, um, whether that's a good or bad, but you know, we, we, we basically policed the, uh, the, the Indian, the, the seas, and we stopped the rest of Europe from this practice of slavery in a very muscular way. And I think that's something that needs to be celebrated. So there, we need to do a, a revision of the revisionist story. And, uh, and, and we need to stand our ground on that. There's a wonderful book by Gad Saad, I've just written, I've just read, and it's, it's a lime green book. It's on the table behind me there. It's called A Parasitic Mind. And at the end of that book, he says, channel the inner honey badger. Like, don't back down. There are a lot of people in our culture who have determined to depict us as these patriarchal white males who everything's bad that we did in the, our ancestors, not ours, did in the past. It's just not true. We've got to do some research restate things and not back down. We're not going to be bullied about this. So I think that's something, it's not a government policy, but I think it's, it's like refocusing and actually being more public. So I would have liked the government to have made more of a statement about what was happening in Batley, for instance, standing up for British culture, fly the flag. You know, when, uh, when my friend Robert Jenrick was criticised on morning TV by Naga Munchetti and uh, Charlie Stay, I was horrified. I was actually in tears. I was so upset. Um, uh, because I, you know, I love this country and I, I can't bear um, people uh, like that dismissing it and being so casual, even criticising the picture of the Queen. And I think what happened after that was, was an amazing reaction. I think the peop British people stood up for the royal family, especially with this sort of Meghan debacle as well, and they're feeling more confident. It's not jingoistic nationalism at all. It's just a very, very natural thing that the glue that holds the country together is a sense of pride in Britain. And that's what we need to rebuild. So we don't, that, you don't do that. You, you can't really move forward. You can't be creative. I don't think you can do anything in a positive way unless you have a sense of well-being and a sense of being at home. And that's something that Roger Scruton talked about a great deal. Building bonds of social trust and feeling at home in, in your own home. That, that's the thing we need to do. So. I don't know how the government can, can do that. I don't know whether it's a policy thing, but I, I definitely think it's a, it's a rhetorical thing. It's something that we need to do, uh, maybe in, in public announcements. I like the idea that we're going to have the national flag flown on government buildings all the time. I think that was a really good move, whoever came up with that idea. Di Diana, um, would you like to ask, can you unmute yourself and ask the question now? I, I just want to know how it comes we as a Conservative Party don't seem to be able to well it's just that the, the, the left-wing parties especially the, the labor party are very very good at promoting the arts and creatives they seem to be very um uh, what, what's the word I'm Pro proactive the word, really. very yeah but what are they promoting mm. yeah so <laughs> we, we seem to be left behind that that's the that's my that was it's just a very very short question i'm wondering that's why what, what, what can we do? What can we do? Well, I don't know. Well, a conservative is about a conservative party. Um, I don't, I'm actually not a member of any of any party at the moment, um, but um, I do lean more conservative. You know, um, 
I, I think that conservatives are about not interfering with people's lives too much, I suppose, whereas there's more of an agenda, isn't there, with, with uh, left-wing politics because they want to use, say, the arts as a vehicle for politics. So politics is being injected into absolutely everything. And I think the way that that's happened is that a lot of the people who are gatekeepers in these organisations, even the National Trust, have passed through the university system in the last 20 years and they've been doing sort of uh, women's studies or feminist studies and whatever. And then the jobs that they get are creating havoc in, in institutions and creating havoc for the people who use the institutions. Sort of, they think of themselves as educating people, but they're actually just haranguing them and trying to create um, a unified vision, a progressive vision. And, and there's a really good book that you should have a look at called, um, it, it's by Saul Alinsky. It was written in 1971 and it, it's called Rules for Radicals. And, and it shows you how restless the left is. You know, they're not, I mean, they're not relaxed like us. They want every day to be part of this progressive uh, march forward for power. It's all about power. So art has always been used as a propaganda tool for, you know, way back to the Roman period and probably earlier. And I think that's why you're seeing a lot more uh, muscular involvement of, of Labour parties with, with the art world, because arts and media are the primary way that you get your message across. You can social engineer, can't you, through, through art in a subtle way. And that's what's happened since the, the fall of the Burning Wall. You know, communism failed and they had to find a new way to mould society. So they did it through something called the, uh, the Long March Through the Institutions. And Mark Sidwell has written a very good book on that subject called The, the, the Long March Through the Institutions. So that's what, that's what, they, that's what they're doing. It, I would say it's, quite a, it's an agenda-driven thing. I'd, whereas the Conservatives, we, we're, we're quite, uh, as, as Roger Scruton said, you know, um, the left are, are very much more like let's you know radical change now radical change now whereas you ask a conservative they would say mm, maybe hesitate you know they're not in a rush to change things that have been established and worked for many many generations I think that's that's usually the best approach but it doesn't seem the most sexy approach especially if you're a young artist um, I hope that answers the question I'll just unmute you now if you're there Greg yes thank you hello Greg unmuted it feels a little bit like swap shop. Do you remember Noel Edmonds? He, I feel like I should have a 1970s phone saying, what are you swapping? It can't be, a, it can't be anything that's alive. So what's your question? <laughs> well, and thank you for a very invigorating talk, Jonathan. Um, it does follow on a little bit from uh, Diana's question, but it's really just, and you touched on this yourself about saying you don't know if it's a policy thing that anyone can do, but it just strikes me that people are quite scared and the, the arts is overwhelmingly left wing and not everybody has your courage and conviction. So I look at the way- Inner honey support. badger. Channel your inner honey badger. Go on, yeah, sorry. Yes, <laughs> yes. But like, like Lawrence Fox, for example, has had to move career now, hasn't he? he he's, his agent dropped he did. him yeah. and all that sort of stuff. And, yeah. and you look on the gas at wanting people to, wanting multi-millionaires that, that J.K. Rowling has made incredibly wealthy to defend her mm. occasionally. And Ray Fiennes has, but most of the others don't. Yeah. Um, what can be done? Because left wing uh, pe people are scared to be anything other than left wing in the arts, aren't they? Apart well, they should listen to people like me and Peter Whittle, my great friend Peter Whittle, who I admire enormously. You know, uh, we're working together now and we're actually going to make a documentary about beauty. How radical is that? Beauty and the importance of it. We're making a 30 minute documentary in Bath in the second week of April uh, as part of a series of things. So I think having people in the culture who speak up. And have, and have confidence really helps other people. They're like sort of seed people. So I'm very active on Instagram. There's about 26 and a half thousand people watch me walking. Today I walked into Bath Abbey, um, maybe walk around for sort of 10 minutes and then 5,000 people will come. At the moment's about a thousand, but normally those little 10 minute video videos. And I use them as a little parable. I'll talk about architecture, but I'll also say, I'll sort of segue into something about be more confident about uh, your own culture and your own own identity. Uh, and then hundreds of students say, will write to me and, and say, I'm in this situation, I'm at uh, an art, I won't say which art schools. I came here to study something I loved, but my love of the subject has been destroyed because everything's about identity politics. It's all about politics and left-wing politics. And I feel demoralized and I want to leave the course. And I feel very sad for people like that. 
and I try to give them confidence. And they all say to me, you know, because you've stood up, I've it's actually given me confidence to, to do something. So um, it's about confidence building, really. Uh, what, is, what else did you say? What can we do? Uh, yes, the, the culture has been, we've kind of lost the culture really to the left. We have to admit defeat with that because they've been so determined. Um, but I think it comes down to individuals. Individuals can uh, spark a change. If you look back in history, it's not really big mass movements. It's maybe a statement, one statement from one person that goes as it would now go as a meme. And it spreads and it spreads and people get on board and that can happen instantaneously. And if, if you have a sense of hope and you're open to it happening. Um, so um, I, when, I, when I first met uh, Peter Whittle, because he was criticizing Sadiq Khan and this sort of uh, commission for the monuments, trying to basically topple any monument that they can find any connect. It's all about power, really. It's not really about the subject that they're talking about, is it? And I said to Peter, I want to see a monument. I want to see you on the fourth plinth. Uh, you know, because you, you, to me, you would be the perfect London mayor. I love that exchange where he said, um, you know, well, frankly, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Khan, no, nobody's going to want to put a statue of you up in London. Uh, I thought that was a, a marvellous thing. So that's why I'm totally backing Lawrence Fox. I think, I think he's got the, the interviews that he did with Peter Whittle and at the Hoover Institute in the last week were, were absolutely wonderful. I'm really encouraging people to, to, to watch those. I hope that's covered it and I've not rambled on too much. A mute button, okay. please. All sounds good to me, John. Um, yes. Richard, we've got a question. We're looking at a question. I'll try and unmute you now. Kind of your question relates to why is this happening? Is it not, Richard? Why is why do you think it's going on? Uh, yes. So I wanted to ask you. So first, thank you very much for a great talk. Uh, thank Mr. you. Masley. I can and see you I up there. I wanted to ask you a question uh, about the intersectionality between culture change, since you talked about the demographic changes, and uh, the democratic change of immigration. So uh, you must be familiar with Tucker Carlson, the American journalist. Yes, mentioning the love day Tucker. That, uh, these, uh, the instigation of those uh, massive and uncontrolled immigration policies are controlled by globalist elites. And they are done purposefully and to sell the ideology, art and culture throughout the United States, especially Hollywood controlled parts um, of American art are used as tools, propaganda tools to sell it. We see it every day. Uh, in every aspect of life. So uh, my, uh, my question was, what is your take on this reasoning that it's being done to change the, the country's culture and electorate, and therefore the way the country is being run? Not only the United States, but the UK and other countries that are being touched. And if you have an, uh, an alternative uh, explanation to why this is happening, uh, I'd love to hear. Hmm. Well, first, of all, I'm very impressed by your very well-stocked bookcase behind you. I always love to see uh, people sitting in front of so many books. It's absolutely glorious. Um, well, yes, um, th this is a question you could also address to Douglas Murray, couldn't you? The st strange death of Europe and uh, uh, the madness of crowds. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't know whether you'd find the answer in those two books because you're looking at the origin of it. You want to know why it's happening rather than cataloguing what is actually happening. And I think... Um, so you've, you've gone into sort of quite, quite an, uh, a, a dangerous area, haven't you, really? But there is something called the, uh, the Kalergi Plan, which um, awards, uh, gives awards for leaders who have been most effective in, bringing, in opening the doors of their country to, to, to more mass immigration. And Angela Merkel, of course, has won that, and Tony Blair won that. I, I found a fact the other day, it was quite interesting, that he opened the doors to Eastern Europe seven years before the EU... Um, demanded it, which is quite interesting. And I think that was obviously a political decision because it is often the case in America and in Europe that the more migrants that you bring in, the more likely they are to, to vote uh, Democrat or Labour. So it's, it's a way of ensuring that your political base is secure. So that's one part of it. But the other side of it, of course, is this globalist plan, which is a, a big long-term plan which uh, you know, um, some of my friends like James Dellingpole is talking about the Great Reset. And, and it's certainly the case that we're building a new society, aren't we? And we're seeing a lot of political user, leaders using exactly the same phrase, build back better. I can't help but thinking that reminds me a little bit of the Great Leap Forward in Mao's China. Um, 
<laughs> which obviously led to what was it 40, 45,000 45 million deaths um, but you know the, the great leap forward the great reset it's, it's Biden's message and I think uh, maybe the leader of the Conservative Party has used it as well um, it's, a, it's a lot of social engineering is taking place and it's being dressed up I think in the words uh, you know sustainability equity and diversity that's the pretty packaging that goes on to what is actually the Fourth Industrial Revolution, which is the title of a book that Klaus Schwab uh, wrote a few years ago. He's the founder and the executive chairman of the World Economic Forum. So um, maybe I shouldn't go too much further into that, but thank you very much for bringing that up as a subject. It's, uh, it's something that I do talk about quite a lot. Uh, Caroline, Caroline, now, Caroline likes to ask a question about plotinus, plutinus, oh, yeah. I think. Um, so, um, Caroline, can you unmute yourself on the screen? Or shall I unmute you? Yeah. You, um, you okay? Yes. I can I hear you. If you and Peter Whittle could um, include Plotinus and the Beautiful. Yes. Absolutely. I will, we'll make sure I do that. Um, the Neoplatonists uh, are very important. Um, it was interesting. I was talking to Gavin Ashenden again this morning. He's had such an Im impact on my thinking. He's, such, he's a psychologist, but he's also a uh, Christian. And he was saying how important the work of Plato was to Christianity. And it's something I'd sort of picked up on. I've been reading quite a bit of Plato recently. It sounds so fresh. You know, we expect when we read these classical authors that it's going to sound as ancient as the Bible, you know, he hath Seth or whatever. But the language is really fresh. It could have been written today. If you read Plato, you could be reading, um, you know, G.K. Chesterton, an apologist for, uh, for Catholicism. It's so clear. So he doesn't go all the way, but he does talk about a single God. Um, and I, I suppose what you're talking about is truth, goodness and beauty, which is the big theme that Roger Scruton was known for. Um, and he opens that wonderful documentary, which has been removed by the BBC from YouTube. Um, and he said, you know, if you'd asked anybody between 1730 and 19, you know, 19, 1750 and 1930, what was the purpose of beauty? They would have said it was a value as important as truth and goodness. We've lost that sense. We don't, we just associate beauty with a surface, aesthetics. And so we dismiss it as a sort of superficial thing. But for thousands of years, beauty was a manifestation of something which was a very deep core value. It was, it was, a, it was a way of you being in the world. Um, so, and that, that comes directly from uh, Platonism and it feeds all the way through. Obviously, you wouldn't have created beautiful cathedrals if that wasn't a, a pretty important value. But somehow by the 1960s, we'd flipped everything around and um, it became trendy for everything to be super, super ugly. And that's affected people's manners now. And I, you know, it, the way people kind of behave, I suppose you see it on TV as well, is, is quite, quite brutal in a way. Even the way that they speak is not as elegant as it used to be. It's quite sort of guttural. And it's, it's hard not to think sometimes we're going back into a bit of a barbaric dark age. Okay, Kerry. Kerry would like to ask a question about technology. Oh. Can you unmute yourself, Kerry? Hello, Jonathan, and thanks, Lance. Um, you can hear me, okay? I can, yes. You're wearing, yes. you're wearing a yellow shirt, is that right? Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. I've got a block um, with quite a lot of people, yeah. <laughs> um, I was wondering, um, do you think that technology or the internet can be things of beauty? Um, I was having this conversation. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, since following you on Instagram, actually. Um, uh, I'm a web developer, but um, I find that my work is often not particularly in service towards beauty unless corporate interests are only minimally involved. <laughs> I see. Yeah, um, I don't know if you saw something I posted a, a few weeks ago, but there was um, Thomas Tallis composed, um, a spem, is it Speminalium? And it's eight choirs. And I saw this um, visualization of, of it on the internet and it was a slowly spinning plan of the eight choirs and um, it visualized digitally was the sound of those of those choirs and it was one of the most sensational things I've ever seen it, it actually brought tears to my eyes I don't know if you've anybody seen it. I'll post it again on Instagram so people can see it and that that really gave me a sort of it was a transcendental experience so you can use technology of course to uh, to reach out to people and transform consciousness absolutely has it, it, I mean I see that all the time when I when I'm browsing through YouTube another question myself sir Jonathan, yeah before you finish 
when you when you look at this art that is so expensive at the moment, I mean, if you look at the prices that are being charged for some of this top level expensive art that we see at the moment, and you look at it and you think to yourself, well, that's that's rubbish, isn't it? That stuff is absolutely rubbish. It just doesn't. I don't know how anyone can pay five million quid for something that looks like that. Um, I, and I think a lot of people feel that. Uh, I certainly do when I'm looking at it. I feel that. Um, how do they manage to get away with it? And, and what what on earth is going on there? What is happening well, that makes people, you know, spend such ludicrous amount of money on art that doesn't look attractive? Well, pe art is worth what people will pay for it. That's always been the case. I don't charge five million for my paintings, almost, but not that, no. Um, but the thing is, the art world is one of the, you know, the, the, the main art world, the international art world, is, is one of the last unregulated money laundering systems in the world. So um, it's a way, <laughs> that's, what's, that's what's creating this artificial uh, inflated prices, really. Uh, as, you, as you know, I was friends with Francis Bacon in the, in the last year of his life, and I remember being absolutely shocked when he told me he sold a painting to a Japanese bank, it was a Chinese bank, and it was £240,000. And at that time, in 1990, that was a vast amount of money. Um, but the prices is what it goes now for now, because it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, what you call it, it's a, it's a limited market, isn't it? There's a, there's a finite amount of those paintings. So they can be traded as derivatives, essentially, or, you know, as stocks. So they're never, it's a limited amount, like the limited amount of gold. So it's always going to go up. You just have to accept that. That's just the market, really. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, you, there are lots of awful art, which is hyped by the major galleries, who then collect it. That's what happened with the Sarches and uh, Damien Hirst's work, isn't it? They, they publicised it by having, staging that exhibition, Sensations, in I think it was in the 1990s, to publicise the artist and get all the media involved. It's a big circus. And then traded at that value, bought it, stored it. Um, I mean, it's a big circus. I've never actually had any involvement with the art world. I, I work directly with my clients. They just come to me and say, you know, could you depict my house from this angle? And we agree on a price. It's, I've, I've taken, I think I'm one of the very rare people who work in this traditional way you know the the commission system in the way that maybe the medicis would have done you know way back in the renaissance they would they would talk to artists and negotiate a price and do that there wouldn't have been any middle middlemen not that i know of anyway i've, I've never dealt with an agent or a gallery which is why i still love what i do long may that continue as well thank you uh, brandon is on the call and i think he'd like to talk about classical art education Brilliant. Do you want to mute yourself, uh, Brandon, and ask your question? Is that okay? Yeah. You like um, yeah. Hi, Jonathan. Hi there. Um, enjoy your, well, all that you're doing at the moment. Thank you. Um, I, I, my observation is that the skills and techniques of unpacking great art, understanding it, um, that should be taught. It used to be taught on the BBC. I've got that Civilization book in the bookshelf here. Mm, when I was great. a teenager, but, you know, I really appreciated that. Opened my eyes. And I think that what's going on at the moment is actually nothing to do with the art itself. It's the art dismissed as being created by a certain race or a class or whatever. And mm. it's, it's not even engaging with the art. No. And I think that the problem is a generation who don't know how to, un also how to unpack it, how to understand it. It's a bit like Shakespeare, isn't it? Unless you put yeah. the effort in and try and understand what's going on in the language and in the plotting mm. and the characterization of the period, you're never going to fully appreciate that. And no. that is teachers, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so I'm just one of those... Ask, ask your views on that because I think we're missing some fantastic art, not just in, in Britain but elsewhere. Yeah. That ancient and modern that's just been completely just you know eviscerated really because white men did it or the, the politics of the person did it didn't match the right um, sound. Demographic, yeah, absolutely. I have moths flying around. Um, yeah, the, the problem is there's been a schism. Once you lose those skills, it's almost impossible to get them back. So all of those guilds which you know made the panels for artists. You know, once those start, you know, operating, the, the, a lot of those things that have been passed on for generations are ended. It, the big problem was the First World War. A lot of craftsmen stopped operating the Second World War. By the 50s and 60s, there were very few people teaching traditional techniques. There were some amazing, there was an exhibition at the um, Modern Art Gallery in, in Edinburgh two or three years ago called um, On British Realism, and it was wonderful. People like 
um, oh, what was his name? There's a, there's a whole host of British realist painters who survived the 60s, but were completely eclipsed by the work of Hepworth and Roger Moore, uh, not Roger Moore, Henry Moore. Um, but now, uh, what's happened in the art schools for the last 20, 25, that's why I didn't go to art school. I went and did an academic degree, at the history, did a history of art and architecture degree at London. I went to look what was going up the Slade and the, and the, uh, the Ruskin in Oxford, and they were just, they'd abandoned technique. So I thought, well, I, I don't need to go to a school in order to not be taught. Um, and there's a book called The Painted Word by Tom Wolfe, who wrote Bonfire of the Vanities. It's a really slim book, it's really worth reading. And he's, he's, the, the title gives it away, The Painted Word. A lot of the art today, this conceptual stuff, is really just illustrating an idea. So you don't, you don't really need any craft skills to do that. You can just, you can just assemble a pile of you know, uh, plastic bags and say, oh, well, it's about the demolition of the patriarchy or the Western civilization. It's about ideas, usually left-wing political ideas, rather than craft-based things. So another idea I had, which is also controversial, Closed down two thirds of British universities because most people, you know, there are, not everybody is mentally and intellectually equipped to go to university. Blair put open too many universities, turned them back into technical colleges to teach uh, practical skills, but also maybe craft skills as well, and also not so urban based. Um, I'm leaving my archive after, and, and my uh, I'm setting up a trust uh, for when I'm no longer here. And I'll be giving um, grants for people to learn how to do dry stone walling and hedge laying. Uh, so giving back country crafts as well, so sort of training people in the countryside. All of those things need to be reinvigorated. It goes back to that theme that I was talking about earlier about picking up the tools that we've thrown down since the 1960s. You know, um, it's a fascinating and very rich history we have, all these crafts. I was in a book years ago uh, called Living National Treasures, the National Trust wrote. Um, and uh, I was a, as a country house painter, but there were people in there who were like saddle makers. Uh, I think they phoned up and they were trying to check whether they got the right name for my, for my trade. And they said, are you Jonathan Miles Lee? I said, yes. He said, are you a lug worm digger? He said, no, no, I'm an artist. But in, in that book, Living National Treasure, it had all of this and whole panoply of people who were basket weavers and, you know, there are, there are wonderful books out there about, you know, br brick, brick, ma brick making and, um, uh, you know, all those traditional skills. We can re reinvigorate them. Uh, and it's not a backward looking thing. It's just something that restorers all need it. I'm rambling on. Next question. <laughs> well, I think we're, we're, we're rapidly running out of time, Jonathan. Can okay. you just tell me, um, what's the future then? Is there hope in this? It's not a bleak wilderness, surely. We can find a way forward where we make art work in the future and it becomes a thing of beauty, can't we? Or is it a hopeless cause and we're all going to end up looking at rotten stuff in it? No, we've had enough of all that, haven't we? Okay. Yes, everybody says yes. If you weren't muted, you'll say yes. No, we... <laughs> Just wave if you agree. Thumbs up. Yeah, we do. We want exactly. Fantastic. We need. We, the British have always survived. You know, we're, we've got an amazing spirit, and I think we've, that tipping point has been reached. I don't think Meghan Markle has done anything very positive for this country, apart from reignite a sense of pride in who we are. And I say it's not jingoistic nationalism to love the Queen. It's a quite a natural thing to have a sense of love for the place you live and a, and a love for Europe as well. We may not be in Europe anymore, but I, know, I, I, I travel, I do like grand tours every couple of years in, in Italy and in Spain, and I'm, I'm starting to explore Greece as well. I want to feed myself on this incredible richness of Western civilization. You know, it's a fragile thing. It's taken thousands of years to build up. And if you let the woke continue, they'll be demolishing it. They'll be toppling things, throwing them in, the, in, in, uh, in, in rivers and lakes. So we, we've got to say to them, look, you are Philistines. You don't deserve the positions that you're in. You don't understand the history and, the, and, and this wonderful cultural uh, uh, manifestation that, that's left to us. You don't honor it. You shouldn't be there. And might have this fantasy of seeing all of these sort of uh, woke gate, gatekeepers of all these institutions standing in lines with cardboard boxes, snaking their way out of institutions. We don't need them anymore. We don't like them. They're not charming. They're not amusing. They're not very attractive. Um, they should dye their hair back the normal natural colour and join the rest of the British people and the European race. Stop attracting attention to yourself and, 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 and being so annoying. And, uh, you know, and, and, and join us in, in, in being, having a civic spirit again and enjoying being at home with everybody else. 
Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> I think you're getting a round of applause for that last. Uh, oh, I am. Look, uh, it's silent uh, clapping. That's a bit PC. <laughs> it's, been, it's been absolutely fascinating talking to you and listening to everything you've said. It's been thank really you. Fascinating. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for giving us all the opportunity to listen to you and hear what you have to say. Please keep going because I think what you're doing is so important and thank so you. interesting. Thank you so much for coming along. And on that, uh, I'll just publicise the events again. Please do come and see the next one as well. They're all fantastic. And thank everyone for coming on uh, this evening and listening. And uh, very much appreciate you. Thank you, John. Thank you very much to everybody. Lovely to be here.